we're going to have three panelists uh, this morning in our first panel. Cody Filling talking about Buried in the Sands of Time, the Armenian Genocide and the Turkish State of Denial. Seth Carpenter Nichols, Saddam Hussein, Kurdish Extermination. Uh, and then finally, Heather Dewey, Mass Graves and Remembrance, Scholarly Memory of the Red Terror in Spain. These are three excellent students, so I'm sure we're going to have a very exciting panel. So, Cody. Okay, so as, uh, as Dr. Melanson just let you know, uh, I'm Cody Filling, and I will be presenting to you guys on uh, what I have named my presentation Buried in the Sands of Time. Uh, and I will be talking to you guys about the Armenian Genocide and about the Turkish State of Denial. Specifically, I'm not going to be talking about if the Armenian Genocide is or is not genocide, which some people still debate. Rather, I'm going to be talking about Turkey and Turkey's modern involvement in that debate. And really, I want to focus on it after the Cold War. Because a lot of the focus has been Turkey as a geostrategic ally. So post-Cold War, we're looking uh, at a time where NATO is now questioned by many uh, leaders as to its role in the modern world. So uh, this is a time period that we'll be looking at this dynamic between Turkey and the Armenian Genocide, which was uh, in 1915. So now kind of just giving you a little bit of context for the genocide, though, because it is really important. Uh, we're looking at the Armenian Genocide taking place in 1915. April 24th was like the opening day. So here we have the diminishment of the Ottoman Empire leading up to World War I. I mean, we can see this goes back pretty far with Greece in 1829 uh, gaining independence. But I mean, a lot of this is pretty recent. Bulgaria, uh, 1908. Libya, Albania, Crete, and Yemen, some of these just a couple years earlier. So the Ottoman officials are, of course, extremely conscious of this history of the Ottoman Empire at this point called like the sick man of Europe dying through these ages. So I mean they are extremely conscious of the fact that the Ottoman Empire is shrinking. And uh, this puts them this puts them on edge. So when they see what they believe to be uh, to be a dangerous demographic within their within their borders, the, the Armenians, uh, and this being the Armenian homeland right here in eastern Anatolia, they, they think that perhaps like the Greeks and the Yemeni and all these, all these demographics in between, that the Armenians could pose a threat right in the middle of the empire then. That this could be the death then of the Armenian, uh, of, not of the Armenian Empire, of the, of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, what else was desired by the, uh, by the Young Turks was that the Young Turks, which was, a, which was a movement that came up as the Ottoman Empire was shrinking and as we, we were moving into, the early Republic of Turkey. Uh, one ethnicity was desired by the Young Turks, and one religion was also desired by the Young Turks. Now, of course, the Young Turks wanted the Turkish ethnicity, and they wanted uh, the religion of Islam, and Armenians were, uh, they had their own church, the Armenian church, which, which is an Orthodox Christian church. So in these two very important ways, the Armenian story didn't fit into the desired Turkish story. Now, the current Turkish national narrative on what happened with the Armenian Genocide is that it was undertaken to secure a wartime border with Russia because Russia had a significant Armenian population as well as the Ottoman population, and they were at war with each other in World War I. Uh, they also say that it was uh, precautionary segregation, that there was minimal loss of life, and this is, of course, the, the narrative pushed out by the Republic of Turkey. This is one that's largely rejected by the academic community for, for many reasons because it doesn't actually fit with what actually happened. This is, this is how the Republic puts it out there for public relations. And uh, that civil war uh, with both sides, that it was a, a religious civil war between uh, Islam and Christianity, and that it was not orchestrated to destroy a people, and that it was not genocide. Now, a lot of reasons why the Republic of Turkey and Azerbaijan, which are the two states that actually support this on an official status, uh, very close allies of each other, uh, is because they could be concerned about financial reparations to, uh, to the survivors of the Armenian Genocide. And this is, of course, 100 years ago, so it would be their descendants. Uh, perhaps, although now that it's been a century, perhaps not anymore, uh, loss of land to possibly the modern state of Armenia or perhaps to a new independent state. And also, uh, extremely importantly, uh, the reputation of their founding fathers, because many of their founding fathers were crucial in orchestrating this genocide, which it was, I mean, it was a genocide as much as global warming is real, and I hope no one, no one's upset at me for saying that. But uh, uh, it, I mean, it's widely accepted in the academic community, is what I mean. 
the fact that it was a genocide. And to, to say that it was genocide then is to slander, they believe, many of their founding fathers. And this is extremely important to Turkish nationalism. And on that point, Article 301 exists in the Turkish Penal Code that makes it illegal to, quote unquote, insult Turkishness. And under this, uh, the Armenian Turkic, uh, Turkish editor, Hrant Dink, uh, he was penalized three times under this for uh, insulting Turkishness by claiming that the Armenian genocide was in fact a genocide. So insulting Turkishness is wonderfully worded because it's ambiguous enough to be extremely useful. It doesn't explicitly mention Armenian genocide. It doesn't explicitly mention Armenians. It doesn't mention World War I. It doesn't mention any of this. But to say that it's genocide insults Turkishness enough to the point that they are looking to penalize people on it. And this way, their law system, their codification doesn't actually itself recognize this event as having happened. It's not, it's not you know, item three. You know, I mean, it's, it's just enough to be useful to them. Orhan Pamuk, uh, or Pamuk, I'm not entirely sure, uh, is a famous Turkish author, and he was uh, in trouble with this in, I believe, 2005. Yeah, he criticized this. Uh, he criticized this policy of Turkey, and he criticized the genocide itself. And he criticized, he criticized the fact that Tur many Turkish nationals don't talk about this and themselves don't acknowledge this. Uh, this was a year before he won the... Uh, uh, the prize for literature. And then uh, Tainar Aksam is a scholar and he works on this as well. And Hrant Dink was actually shot uh, in the back of the head by a 17 year old Turkish ultra nationalist. Orhan Pamuk has received many threats and was criticized heavily by newspapers in Turkey. And Tainar Aksam has been physically assaulted coming out of a conference. And his email, uh, he says, is filled with death threats from anonymous emails. Uh, all the time. So all three of these men, and of course many others, uh, are in trouble from the Turkish government and many Turkish nationals, Turkish civilians, uh, because of how they are addressing uh, the Armenian genocide. Now one way that it's denied also is factcheckarmenia.com. This came out in 2015, which is 100 years, you know, the centennial of the Armenian genocide. So we are, uh, we're seeing this done uh, on newspapers, they, they put out ads, ads in newspapers and they have posters next to Armenian parks as well. A couple US denialists are Gunter Louis, uh, Heath Lowry, and Justin McCarthy. Uh, Louis has sent, sent messages to like the Toronto School Board telling them to not teach the Armenian genocide. Uh, Lowry had be, uh, acquired a position as a Princeton chair, which many have argued that he doesn't actually uh, doesn't actually deserve because he has never had a full-time faculty position, nor has he had any major uh, publications in the field, but he acquired the Ataturk Chair for Turkish Studies in Princeton, and many believe that it's because of his enrollment in, in Turkey. And uh, Gunter Louis, I'm sorry, and then Justin McCarthy has uh, said many times uh, that the war is justified, the war being the civil war and not the Armenian Genocide. And he once uh, said to a Turkish Congress, uh, those who began the conflict were the Armenian nationalists, the Armenian revolutionaries. So the guilt is on their heads, clearly blaming the victims of the Armenian genocide, which is up to 1.5 million Armenian individuals, uh, instead of acknowledging, uh, acknowledging the actual guilt in this event. Yeah, uh, here's sort of a more official Turkish version of this. Uh, this, this ambassador, uh, Kondemir, he sent this letter to Robert J. Lifton, who was a scholar, and in the 1980s, Lifton had published uh, a book called The Nazi Doctors, Medical Killings and the Psychology of Genocide. And this book featured uh, the Armenian Genocide in it, and it, it discussed psychology involving the Armenian Genocide, specifically the perpetrators of the, that genocide. And he received this letter uh, because of it, obviously a Turkish state official, and this is uh, this is an example, one example of many, of the official Turkish movement to deny this genocide. Uh, here are a couple a couple quotes from it. I mean, he he once again calls it a tragic civil war initiated by the, by the Armenian nationalists. Uh, he, I mean, it was it was between Muslim and Christian populations. The way that he discusses it almost equates the suffering 
uh, between the two, between the 1.5 million and, and, the, and the couple of Turkish nationals that involved in this death. Uh, and uh, one thing that's really important that they always cite, what makes this civil war, they say, is this, is this rebellion at Van, the siege at Van. But that was 1,300 Armenians taking up arms uh, at, this, at this city in Van, next to Lake Van. And, uh, and they, they say that this is what makes the civil war. Other scholars have argued that if that makes this a civil war, then the Warsaw Ghetto makes the Holocaust a civil war. I mean, just, just because of the scale and everything that happened uh, going on, and also the intent, which is crucial to defining what is genocide. Now, turning to the US government, we see a lot of failure to recognize. It was shot down in the Senate in 1989. Uh, because in 1989, Turkey blocked U.S. Navy ships from entering Turkish waters, and it banned all U.S. military training in Turkey because just because the U.S. was looking to officially recognize the Armenian genocide. Uh, this happened again in 2000. Uh, U.S. flights from Turkish air bases were all shut down. And uh, in 2007, uh, the U.S. had its supply lines to Iraq, uh, to its uh, war in Iraq, uh, threatened to be shut down, and I believe one third of all uh, fuel that the soldiers in Iraq were using was coming through Turkey. So this would have definitely been felt by the U.S. military involved in Iraq. So of course uh, it was shot down then too in uh, in the U.S. House Foreign Relations Committee. It's been promised uh, by presidents to be. I, I looked into it. President Trump didn't uh, didn't make this as a campaign promise, but looking back, uh, uh, President Obama pres uh, promised it. Uh, Bush did. Clinton did. H.W. Bush did, Reagan did, moving up this line, almost every single president that we've had has made this a campaign promise to recognize it, but then has, uh, has eventually not recognized it. Uh, no official recognition has come out of the White House uh, to this time. And now, here's the reason why. Here's Turkey, as you can see, and you can see it borders Syria, it borders Iraq, it borders Iran, and, uh, and a collection of other countries as well. The U.S. is heavily involved in this region of the world, and the U.S. has very few allies in this region of the world. Uh, now, even in the, this post-Cold War era, we're looking at involvement in Syria and Iraq, and once again, tensions rising with Iran. Turkey, as an ally, remains extremely important. Also, not to forget, even though it's not actually a border, uh, it controls the Strait of Bosphorus because of Istanbul, which the Strait of Bosphorus is part of what makes Crimea useful because Crimea is a warm water port that doesn't freeze uh, in the winter, which is extremely useful for Russia. So by controlling the Strait of Bosphorus, there is some control over trade to this part of what is now apparently Russia in Crimea. So Turkey, even now following, uh, following the Cold War, following tensions with the Soviet Union, is still an extremely important ally in the region uh, Samantha Power, who was the UN ambassador until recently, uh, said that no U.S. president has ever made genocide prevention a priority, and no U.S. president has ever suffered politically for his indifference to its occurrence. It is thus no coincidence that genocide rages on. Now, Samantha Power, she said this, uh, this was in an interview before her, before her book, A Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide, uh, which is a very famous book on genocide. And she, she since became a UN ambassador, and she uh, had been criticizing. Well, she, when Obama was running, she, she was uh, on Obama's campaign side, and then she became Obama's UN ambassador later. And uh, during her stay as ambassador, though, she, she never pushed to have the Armenian Genocide recognized. So even who might be seen as a crusader for uh, Armenian Genocide recognition in the United States has had to kind of back off on this issue just because of the extreme importance that Turkey still has in geostrategy even today in 20, 2016, then 2017, uh, now, we still, we still see this. So the concluding thoughts are actually that even now that the Cold War has ended, even now that Russia may or may not be an enemy, it's always difficult to tell. We'll find out next week, I guess. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, even, even now that, that the dynamic has changed and that NATO is in a position that is questionable at the moment by many leaders on both the left and the right, it's been questioned. Uh, we still see that because of where Turkey sits, Turkey straddling between Europe and Asia, Turkey sitting right there as one of the few allies that exist in the Middle East, Turkey 
there close to Russia and Iran and Syria, it will likely never stop being extremely important to global affairs, U.S. affairs or not, global affairs, Turkey remains important. And uh, that is why it seems extremely unlikely that this genocide, now 100 years old, will likely not be recognized in the future. 45 individual U.S. states have recognized it. Indiana is one of the five that has not. Uh, and even, even though 90% of our states have recognized it, it's likely that on a national scale, uh, the United States will not do so. I'm Seth Carpenter Nichols, and my paper is on Saddam and the Kurdish extermination. The world in the 20th century perhaps has undergone the most triumphs that have been carried down for the next several lifetimes. However, tragedies have occurred in wars, oppression, and mass murder all of which have happened in nations as Nazi Germany, Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda. In the Middle East, Iraq under Saddam Hussein is another country. With an iron fist, Saddam controlled Iraq by fear, violence, paranoia, and destroyed every obstacle in his way for st stability and absolute power. Saddam horribly mistreated his people, but the Kurds felt the brunt of his wrath. The Kurds were targeted for extermination by Saddam because of his party's doctrine, which included discrimination and murder of the Kurds and claiming that they were traitors for siding with the Shia Muslims in the Iran-Iraq war. The Kurdish people throughout history were subject to ridicule, displacement, and were engaged in conflict. They are stateless people and scattered in the Middle East with a total population of nearly 25 million at one point. The Kurdish people settled in Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq, but were mostly divided by religion and borders. The Kurds are said to have no friends but the mountains because their national identity was formed by the mistrust of Turks and Arabs and living in the snowy Zagros Mountains, which stood between southeastern Turkey, passed through northern Iraq, into western Iran. After the Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I, Kurdistan was placed under a British mandate and given the chance for statehood under Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. However, due to contradicting treaties, all the promises for a Kurdish independent state were superseded, resulting in dictator Kemal Ataturk to destroy thousands of Kurdish villages in the Turkish Republic and outlawing the Turkish lifestyle and culture until 1931. In 1946, the United States allied themselves with Kurdish nationalism to prevent the spread of communism. However, this was not a strong unity, as the United States did not show diplomatic commitment, but did view the Kurds as minor allies to fight off the Soviet Union. The Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations gave secret support to the Kurds in fighting leftist military dictator Abdel Karim Qasim in Iraq, the CIA and the Shah of Iran also assisted the Kurds in fighting the new Iraqi Ba'ath Party and supporting Kurdish ally Mustafa Barzani. After the Ba'ath Party secured several military victories, Barzani was able to negotiate a ceasefire which contained an agreement that all weapons be surrendered and Barzani and his men would acknowledge Baghdad's sovereignty over Kurdistan. The Kurds were also given their freedom to vote and elect local leaders and freely express their linguistic and cultural rights. However, Barzani's relations with Baghdad quickly fell apart. In 1958, Saddam Hussein joined the newly established Ba'ath Socialist Party as an enforcer. He returned after three years of exile in Syria and later Egypt after a failed assassination attempt against the Iraqi president. He took part in a successful coup to overthrow Qasim and his government on February 8, 1963, as Saddam was a close ally to members Abdel Salim Arif and Ahmed Hassan al-Bakar. The 1968 revolution followed, and Saddam quickly climbed the ladder of party leadership. Saddam made al-Bakar the president of Iraq, as well as prime minister and minister of defense, and himself the deputy. Saddam held the position of deputy for 11 years and quick, 
quickly rose through the ranks of the Iraqi military. In 1979, Saddam took full control of Iraq after killing and threatening both men. Iraq became a one-party Sunni Islamic secular state. Saddam expanded the Iraqi army and drained Iraq's wealth for his palaces, personal affairs, and growing his own power, and sought to be the most dominant ruler in the Middle East. Saddam Hussein set his eyes on multiple targets, including the Kurdish populations for discrimination and murder as part of the Ba'ath Party ideology. The party was an Arabic nationalist party defined by Iraqi history, culture, and memory. Discrimination against the Kurds was part of the party's doctrine. At first, Saddam forcefully relocated the Kurds to southern Iraq and ordered that 4,000 square miles of Kurdish territory in northern Iraq be Arabized. This diluted all mixed race zones in the area, and Iraq established a 6 to 12 mile wide prohibited zone along the Iranian border. This resulted in every Kurdish village inside the zone being destroyed with bulldozers and guns. Some of the Kurdish people were sent to military settlements in Iraqi deserts. Though the Iraqi government offered compensation, Kurdish sources claimed that close to half a million Kurdish people were forced to resettle between 1978 and 1979. On September 22, 1980, the Iran-Iraq War commenced after Saddam disobeyed the 1975 Algiers Agreement to take the Shat al-Arab waterway and led a strike on Khuzestan after assassinating a Shiite clergyman and supporter of Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini responded by urging the Kurds in Iraq, in Iraq to rebel against Saddam. Afraid that the Kurds were conspiring against him, Saddam launched several aggressive policies all of which intensified as the war progressed. In 1987, Saddam enacted what historian Craig Douglas Albert called a scorched earth policy. To dissuade the Kurds with mass, mass executions and more deportations, in six months, around 500 Kurdish villages were set ablaze. Many Kurds fled to Iran and Turkey, and those who stayed were executed. Saddam issued these terroristic attacks in horrific fashion, including the Al Anfal campaign from the spring to the summer of 1988, consisting of eight military operations and the use of chemical weapons, napalm, and phosphorus to prevent the Kurds from fighting alongside the Iranians. One of the worst attacks occurred in the Kurdish city of Halabja on March 16, 1988. 5,000 Kurds out of the 70,000 in the city were killed. During al fall, 3,000 Kurdish villages were destroyed, 1.5 million Kurds were displaced, and 180,000 individual Kurds lost their lives. The effects of Saddam's attacks were perhaps the most devastating in the years that followed. Today, the soil in Halabja is still too contaminated to be farmed on. Descendants of the survivors of the bombings either in Halabja or in nearby regions are said to suffer from the effects of chemical weapon strikes. Ailments include infertility, sterility, all kinds of cancer, birth deformities, blood diseases, insomnia, depression, mental illnesses, and numerous phobias. Kurdish children were also said to be so scared when they heard the planes fly over them that they urinated themselves for what might happen. The United States knew about the crimes Saddam committed, and they supposedly condemned the use of chemical weapons, but the country took a neutral position. America severed ties with Iran, including issuing an embargo after the Iranian Revolution and hostage crisis. When the Iran-Iraq War started, the United States feared that Iran would seize all of Iraq's oil reserves and the Middle East would be destabilized if Khomeini won. As the war dragged on, the United States sided more and more with Iraq. The Reagan administration gave half a billion dollars in agricultural credits to buy American grain, wheat, and rice to Iraq. The United States discovered that Iraq purchased as much as 4,000 tons of chemical weapons and engaged in chemical warfare 195 times. From 1983 to 1988, 50,000 people were either killed or were wounded as a result. 
the U.S. Secretary of State George P. Schultz knew of Saddam's use of chemical <clears throat> weapons, but it took him until March 4th, 1984, about six months, to order the State Department spokesperson to issue a condemnation. The Congress did not take any further action against Saddam. Some U.S. officials even defended Saddam's use of chemical weapons. The U.S. eventually ordered an official investigation, and the U.N. discovered that mustard gas and tabin gas were used. Sanctions were not issued, and no actions were taken until after the Gulf War. The U.N. Security Council Resolution 688 was, pat was issued that year, creating a no-fly zone under Iraq's 36th parallel from dropping bombs on Kurdish villages, gassing cities, strifing villagers, and set fires on hills. However, Saddam was allowed to stay in power for another 12 years. President H George H.W. Bush urged the people of Iraq to overthrow Saddam, but the Iraqi Air Force General George Sada claimed that Saddam was too powerful and his people were too weak. The limited actions against Saddam were almost entirely useless. He had billions in gold and high-tech equipment, and he passed laws such as the Oil for Food campaign, which plundered the Iraqi people's money to make billions off unauthorized currency, to rebuild his regime from the Gulf War, and allowed briberies and kickbacks to take place. Saddam, in this, attempted to isolate the Kurds as much as possible, including limiting the flow of electricity into Kurdish hospitals. He even made it illegal for Kurds not to buy cell phones. But the United States established a no-fly zone in Kurdish areas, and they purchased a $15,000 satellite device to create a call center. In March 20th, 2003, Op Operation Iraqi Freedom was initiated. Saddam was found nine months later and was sentenced to death three years later for his crimes. For the Kurds, they're finally free to set up their own reforms as having the lowest tax rates in the world, actively in increasing women's rights in the Middle East, practicing a more moderate version of Islam, taking in Christian refugees from Southern Iraq, and having a better understanding of the federal system, life in northern Iraq for the Kurds has gotten better and looks as if a promising future is just ahead. And several do government documents and reports compiled from the likes of Joe Biden and Pell Claiborne Pell said that Saddam, that Saddam's action resulted in the loss of tens of thousands of lives Two million Kurds were on refuge in the Ar Iraq, Turkey, and Iranian Iraq borders, and 2,000 of which were dying a day, and that George H.W. Bush administration reacted too late to take any action. The weapons they discovered from Saddam contained sarin and mustard gas. The An Anfal campaign was declared a form of genocide and was branded the most heinous crime known to man humankind and confiscated Iraqi reports, it was proven that Saddam's government planned to entirely wipe out rural Kurdish life. In July 1995, the U.S. Secretary of State Warren Christopher signed a communique that Iraq committed genocide against the rural Kurds. The genocide was later documented by the Human Rights Watch, who later hired lawyer Richard Dicker in 1994 to create a legal case to present to the International Court of Justice. Warren Christopher endorsed this action for several years. Decker and the colleague Eust Hilterman tried to find a European state to join them in the lawsuit to present the case to the International Court of Justice. However, no European power joined in that legal case. In conclusion, the Kurdish extermination in Iraq by Saddam was made were made because they were seen as traitors and enemies of, of Saddam's party out party ideology. Many Kurds lost their lives, especially in the Iran-Iraq war and such campaigns as Anfal. The United States ignored these murderous acts because Saddam was fighting Iran. The Kurdish extermination was later labeled as a genocide by the United States Kurdish leaders 
and the Human Rights Watch. In analyzing this horrible atrocity against the Kurds, it, is, it looks unlikely that these people will receive any proper closure, healing and justice for everything they have been through. Hopefully, that will soon happen. Okay, hello, I'm Heather Dewey, and I will admit that while I don't like giving speeches, I do like ranting about history, so this is gonna be fun. So we're gonna be talking about mass graves and remembrance, and this is gonna be the memory of the Red Terror in the Spanish Civil War. Now the Red Terror is not related to the United States Red Terror, like the whole communist scare. This actually refers to something that happened during the Civil War on one of the sides of the battle. So the Spanish Civil War occurred from 1936 to 1939 and was fought between two sides that, as is the case with most wars, actually consisted of 20 or 30 smaller groups all fighting on one side. So in this war, we have the Republicans who supported the democratically elected Second Spanish Republic and the official government of Spain. And amongst these people, you would have people like generally what you would consider the political left. You had socialists, you had anarchists, you had many regular civilians, and you even had unofficial soldiers from countries like Great Britain and France, which became known as the International Brigades. On the political right, you had the nationalists, and these were led by what you would consider to be the traditional power structures of Spain. So you had your military people like General Francisco Franco, you had the aristocracy, you had members of the Catholic Church, which held a lot of power in Spain, and in general, you had political fascists who approved of a sort of totalitarian, military-led government. And in this battle, what happened was basically the Second Spanish Republic came to power and was instantly opposed by several groups of the military led by Franco, whose name is hopefully sounding familiar to you guys because he was the dictator of Spain from about 1939 to 1975. Now, in this war, what happened to Spain was the countryside became divided up between the two parties. The nationalists came up through northern Africa, up through southern Spain, and managed to gain grounding in many of the major cities there. Well, the Second Spanish Republic tended to hold a lot of the cities in the north, including the capital of Madrid. And one of the things that this war is very well known for is the fact that it gave birth to several of the worst atrocities in wartime. Now, considering this is one country, um, the Red Terror, not counting actual casualties from the war, killed about 55,000 people. And what the Red Terror was, was basically this movement of basically violence, attacks, murders, church burnings, and the defilement of clergy members' bodies because they were assumed to be on the side of the nationalists. And here we actually get to see some of their propaganda explaining why they attacked the church that would be on the left when they're accusing them of supporting the fascists. And then you get to see the ceremonial execution of the Statue of the Sacred Heart, which was a very well-known Catholic symbol. Excuse me, I'm going to turn my page. However, it's also important to note that in the scholarly memory of the Spanish Civil War, there's another thing that's called the White Terror. And this had about three times the death count of the Red Terror and occurred during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. And unfortunately, this consi it consisted of a lot of the violence that you would assume happens under a dictatorship. There were disappearances, executions, violence, murders. People would be taken from their homes in the, in the middle of the night and driven out on paseos, which were based off of United States gangster movies, and essentially resulted in people being dragged out to the countryside, forced to dig their own graves, shot in the head, and then buried in unmarked areas. And these happened because, as with a lot of the fascists of this time, the nationalists were dedicated to purging Spain of what they considered to be a Republican cancer. So many of the former Republicans, their friends, their families, Anyone who had any sort of relation to them were taken in these killings. If they were not killed, they were forced to live in poor socioeconomic conditions, which involved a lack of food, lack of proper housing, lack of political access. Again, all the sorts of things you would expect under a dictatorship of this kind. Now, I'm gonna be taking you through four different time periods, and we've already discussed one, which was the Spanish Civil War, and then you have the, gen the dictatorship of General Franco. What happened after that was when Franco died in 1975, basically the political left and the political right decided to try to form again a democracy. However, one of the key parts of trying to form a democracy after such a bloody civil war was both sides basically decided that to keep the peace, 
they were not going to talk about any of the atrocities that happened. This time, this period of time became known as the Pact of Oblivion, when memory basically did not have any access or public recourse. And this lasted from about 1977 until 2000, when one man, a journalist by the name of Emilio Silva, went to try to find his grandfather's unmarked grave in the countryside. He ended up finding it outside of Leon, and what this actually ended up happening was becoming a catalyst for many exhumations of the mass graves of Republican soldiers. Now, to kind of give you an estimate of how many people are buried around the Spanish countryside is the lower estimates are between 155,000 and 220,000 people. Unfortunately, you're not going to find any accurate records of this because, of course, unofficial executions, dictatorship, you don't keep records of these kinds of things. But this is where a lot of my research actually came into play, because what you see after the exhumations begin is a lot of this resurgence of Republican memory. Now, when I'm talking about memory, I'm actually talking about sort of the expressions of particular groups' experiences in the war finally getting to be able to come out into the public. Um, and a good example of this would be, for instance, after World War II, when the Jewish people began to actually talk about what happened to them. The Republicans did not have a chance to do this until the year 2000 and later on, because they finally had some sort of audience and they finally had the ability to come out and speak forth about these things. However, a lot of this stuff did not actually happen unopposed. What Spain ended up doing was passing several laws, the most famous of which is the Law of Historical Memory of 2007. And what this basically did was it gave Republicans legal access to actually come forward and tell their stories. It started this whole national movement to try to unearth the graves. And basically any Francoist symbols that were decorating the cities of Spain, and I'm talking street names, buildings, monuments, started to become torn down as people started to move away from the dictatorship and more into a balanced view of what happened during the Civil War. However, this did not happen unopposed. Again, the political right tended to try to remove or kind of, re well, I'm sorry, I saw you waving and I got distracted. So basically what happened was the political right tried to basically limit the effects of this law. They did not want the Franco symbols to be removed. They did not want the nationalist memory to be tarnished because these are the people that they are originated with and developed from. Another popular um, group that was very efficient at finding the graves was something known as the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory which made it its mission to allow Republican memory to gain access to the populations of Spain and start to tell their stories. Again, this also did not happen unopposed. And even today, a lot of the national efforts to exhume the graves have been stopped as the two groups continue to fight it out in the Parliament of Spain. However, this is where a lot of my main research come, came in. Seeing that the exhumations of graves were having a powerful effect in Spain, I decided to look at what these effects on the collective memory actually were. In order to do this, I ended up looking at the archives of two popular Spanish newspapers, the left-leaning El País and the right-wing ABC. And some of the things you begin to notice is that the groups who leaned towards the political left were much more open about the Republican memory coming out because these were the people that they were based off of. The war itself was considered sort of a political ideology battleground between the very um, diverse political left and right that characterized the 1930s and 1940s. Whereas the right wing, again, based on the nationalists, were kind of opposed to the idea of having to remove Franco's symbols. They did not want the monuments taken away, especially the Valley of the Fallen, which is the most famous nationalist symbol in Spain. And what you begin to see by looking at the newspapers and looking about accounts of the Spanish public is that the collective memory of who the Republicans were started to change. Of course, under General Francisco Franco, you started to get the idea that the Republicans basically were the bad guys. They did all these horrible things. They were going to destroy Spain. They were going to destroy anything that made it Spanish. Again, kind of going back to those almost ethnic ties to the country. We are this culture. We run by the Catholic Church. We have a military, we have an aristocracy. So of course, the Republicans had a very bad rap under their dictatorship. However, once you start to get the exhumations of the mass graves, you start to see people coming forward, almost the opposite happens, and the Republicans kind of get viewed as the official good guys of the Civil War. 
And of course, there's always a problem when you have a civil war about labeling one group the good guys and one group the bad guys, which is all the descendants are still alive and are still there to fight it out in the streets, which has actually happened before, especially with older Spanish people who strongly identify with the Republicans or with the nationalists. However, when it actually comes to sort of the official collective memory, you get this almost romanticization or idealization of the Republicans, which has had a very strong effect on the scholarly memory of what is written. And this was the main point of my research, which was to see how much is scholarly memory, things like history books, sources that you would consider these credible um, end-all, be-all sources, how are they reacting to this? And what you end up seeing is because of this romanticization, a lot of the scholarly sources started to write about the Red Terror differently. Mm -hmm. Of course, you no longer had the idea that they were, of course, the overall bad guys. But now they were becoming this very romanticized group. Even the Red Terror itself was no longer considered to be part of the Republic, but literally the work of, and I'm going to do scare quotes here, scare quotes here, because that is the literal term that every source used, uncontrollables who the government had no control over, despite a lot of this action happening in the major cities of Spain. And these, um, this work can be seen dating from about 2000 up to about 2012, when there started to be a backlash of this idea that the Republicans were totally innocent. And in this backlash, a lot of people, especially historian Julius Ruiz, who's very popular in Spain and the United States, started to say that, well, no, actually, the Red Terror was still part of the Second Spanish Republic. They did not condemn it. They gave speeches that openly encouraged it. And unfortunately, here's kind of where Spain is left. The second interpretation has received a lot of backlash within the country itself while receiving praise outside of it. And honestly, the main point of this research was seeing how important it is to examine how the collective perception of a group changes how the history is written about. Because the Republicans are starting to be seen as the heroes, the literature has changed to follow the same. And it'll be interesting to see in the next few years if it continues to follow this trend, or if that second interpretation starts to become more popular. And that's sort of the quick rundown of this, so. <laughs> Questions from the audience, <coughs> James. Hey, um, I, so I've seen a, a dominant theme amongst you guys, like nationalism, things of that sort. Now I'm curious if you've gone any into any of the prior research as to see, like, was it more of a push towards a global, uh, globalized uh, world, whereas we constantly see an entrench into Mr. Fielding will know um, the IR position of realism as opposed to liberal institutionalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you guys have seen that as a dominant theme over your research. <clears throat> well, certainly, uh, certainly, international relations realism, which which discusses uh, geopolitics and and the the importance of protecting one's own country, and uh, and all this is definitely definitely perceivable uh, in both Turkey, in the sense that Turkey must protect its own people uh, from this this fake air fake in quotes uh, this fake story of the Armenian genocide, and certainly on the U.S. and other other NATO powers in that they have to protect their national interests because any any war that, that the United States engages in is for national security, this, you know, uh, as as it's put out, you know. So so protecting its interests overseas then is then protecting the United States, and uh, this is something that France had to weigh heavily. France officially recognized the Armenian genocide and has uh, and got in trouble from Turkey with it. it lost. A $149 million deal for a satellite, a $7 billion deal with the Turkish military. Germany had a similar story. France now has it illegal to deny the Armenian genocide, just like it has it illegal to, die the, to deny the Holocaust. So uh, definitely, definitely this idea of, of kind of planting stakes around one's borders uh, while having to weigh the importance of the past is, is something that can seem to be seen in this story. I got nothing new to add. Uh, Iraq is, was very nationalistic because they want to protect their interests and also be the dominant country in the Arab world. That's all I got to say. I'm going to say with mine, you're going to have a pretty special case coming up because it was an actual civil war and not really a battle against some sort of outside enemy. What you're actually seeing with mine is not so much the realism as it is sort of a battle between ideologies 
Because the Second Spanish Republic was heavily associated with socialism, during the war it received aid from the Soviet Union and Mexico, while the nationalists ended up receiving aid from Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. So what you're seeing is not so much nationalism as we would think of it, but their definition of natural nationalism, which was kind of holding on to the traditional order. So. Um, my question's for Cody. And like you said how um, like a lot of US presidents make campaign promises to uh, recognize the Armenian genocide, like Obama, Bush, Clinton, and H.W. Bush. But like what, why would they like, want to make that like a vital campaign promise? Like, is it because there's a large Armenian population in the United States? Or is it because a lot of like the West has recognized the Armenian trips as well? <laughs> right. Um, so, so a lot of the recognition, the Western recognition, pre, I mean, a lot of these campaign promises predate the wide movement into Western recognition, which is a largely actually post Cold War. A lot of it, like France, is post Cold War. Germany is also post Cold War, and German recognition was was really large given the Holocaust story and Turkey's relationship with Germany. Um, so uh, a lot of I mean, the campaign promise is never something in, in the largest speeches. I mean, speeches are always catered when someone gives it. They, it's pointed towards the demographic that exists in the area where the speech is being given. So a lot of it, a lot of it exists because, uh, because it's a campaign promise approaching the people who live in that region. And, uh, and oftentimes, like I, like I sincerely, uh, like I watched some of the videos of these when, when I was doing this, and I sincerely believe that a lot of them really wanted to recognize the Armenian Genocide. And oftentimes when people campaign, they really want to bring in something different. You know, I mean, I mean they are politicians, but they do actually want change. Uh, I think that oftentimes uh, they, uh, they think that they'll be able to fix the situation, or they'll be able to change it. And then they, they become president, they sit in that, in that Oval Office behind that Resolute Desk, and they, Figure out that they just can't, based on uh, based on international relations, based on uh, geo strategy, and uh, so I I think a lot of it ends up being that they don't change their position on the fact that they think it should be, but they change their idea that they will actually do it. it? Talk about the Kurds and uh, how they're uh, sort of like like at peace now, but you didn't talk anything about the repeat of history that Turk. Turkey wants to eliminate the Kurds. Do you see any of that in your research? I did not think about putting that in my research because it would have distracted my audience from one singular country because I was focusing on Iraq, right. not Turkey. Okay. But, but thank you for pointing that out. That's true. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Three great papers, and uh, it's fascinating. You know, all of us we've, we've kind of grown up here with America and our own national heritage, and now we're doing history and we're looking critically upon the rest of the world. And I bring this up because I I lived a couple of years in Turkey. I taught high school and university there, and I made the mistake not knowing about the ban on talking about Armenia. This was in 1999. Kosovo was happening. We're talking about current events, and I mentioned ethnic cleansing. The Turkish students didn't know what that was. So I said, oh, it's kind of like what happened to the Armenians here. <laughs> blank stairs, blank stairs all around. And then I finished up class, going to the teacher's lounge and say, my God, kids here don't even know their own history. They don't even know about Armenians. Uncomfortable silence. One of the <laughs> Turkish teachers took me off the side and says, that never happened. And then it became clear to me that this was something you couldn't teach. And you know, this started a larger conversation in which the Turks all thought, my friends thought this was generally a good idea because it could rip Turkey apart. Mm -hmm. And then they brought up American Indians. They said, why are you condemning us for what <laughs> happened with our own history? As America, we still haven't even recognized it as a genocide against American Indians. There's been reprisals after the Civil War and slavery, which gets into the issue of like the Spanish Civil War. So I guess my overall question <coughs> to everyone is that as, as an individual, yourself as a scholar, how do you kind of balance this idea about analyzing people in other countries, when at the same time, as a nation here in America, we're still trying to digest these similar sorts of issues. Um, I think it's very, sorry. <laughs> I think it's very important to keep your national history in mind. And remember that, of course, people are going to be facing a lot of difficulties when it comes to sort of accepting their own history, as we have in the United States as well, especially because a lot of these topics were very important in the present day. 
especially with the case of the Spanish Civil War and the fact that I had to use the term romanticizing when I really did not want to, um, because it just, it paints the wrong picture of this. It's very hard to can sort of look at these people and think of them objectively when you have your own things with your country that are kind of hard mm. to swallow. Again, the Spanish, or our own civil war, which caused a lot of unrest between the two sides. And we still have issues with people wanting to fly the Confederate flag or wanting to experience it as part of their heritage. You have to wonder if the same thing is happening in other countries like Spain, where they know that their grandfather fought for the nationalists and was killed during the Red Terror. And now why are you saying that all these horrible things happened? Or <laughs> it's very hard to come to a middle ground. Well, I think that you bring up a really good point, Dr. Schuster. I, I definitely, definitely, growing, uh, all of us, I believe, grew up in the United States and were educated in, in the United States. And, and uh, the high school that I attended, uh, minimal discussion of what happened to Native Americans, both in the United States and in other parts of the Americas, uh, minimal discussion. And this definitely does, does cause a limitation on students. And, uh, and as you were saying, with with Turkey, I was reading that uh, textbooks, some textbooks explicitly deny this, and they, and they discuss it as, as a civil war because 1,300 against several thousand is a civil war. And, uh, and this definitely uh, makes, makes understanding this fall short. We don't have anything like Article 301 where if we say Native American genocide, we can be punished for <coughs> insulting Americanness or anything like this. Uh, so certainly, I mean, we, what, what I've found helps is reading it. Now, I, I, read, I read Hrant Dink's blog, his online blog, before he, before he was murdered. And I read, uh, I read some of the works of Pamuk. So reading the literature and the stories and the biographies of the people who are involved in this certainly helps you to empathize with it. Although definitely that, that having grown up with that and having that more intimate understanding is, is a challenge. You bring up an in interesting question, doctor. Because in my opinion, you, it, it, you don't get everything at once. You acquire as you go. Like, I didn't know anything about the Kurds or how bad Saddam was until I, as I progressed my educational career. And I didn't know until I got into college that a lot of these genocides and horrible acts were ignored or, or anything. And that they were ignored by politics, and I was trying to portray that in my paper, that politics is dirty and can play a real, it can be a real factor on what is said and what is not said. But, but at the same time, as I present my paper, I want to talk about that, but really not demonize the United States, but more of the action that was taking place in Iraq with the Kurds. So yeah. Um, I have one question I want to direct towards Heather, but then this is also for all three of you. Um, firstly, I'm just curious, why did it take something like a quarter of a century for Republicans to feel comfortable talking about the white terror? Because we know, you know, the Franco regime ends in the 70s, yet you said it takes until 2000 um, for them to talk about. So I'm curious where, what the barriers were um, to, to discussing. Um, and then the question I want to ask all of you guys who have talked about memory and the, <clears throat> the presentation of war over years and how it's been treated by scholars in the years since, um, is what you think about our kind of fake news era and whether in our age of the internet and easy access to information, it makes it easier to identify what you consider the truths of these wars and genocides, um, or makes it easier to deny them. I mean, you're the website you found, Cody, of Armenia Facts. You know, it, in some ways, it's easier to go and find oral histories and images and recollections. But on the other hand, if we can have teenagers in Macedonia skewing our elections, surely it's easier for people to deny. Um, so. <coughs> Okay, so a little bit of this goes back to what I call the Pact of Oblivion, which I kind of mentioned in the speech. And what the Pact of Oblivion was, was this kind of unspoken agreement to just not talk about the war. And there are a couple different barriers for this. The first one of which was they just started to make a sort of democracy again. 
and neither group wanted to say something that would incriminate the other and cause another civil war to happen, especially considering a lot of the original nationalists and republicans who didn't get executed were still alive and were still willing to go to those measures to preserve what they thought of as the correct history. There's also a lot of social tension not to bring it up, again, because you're living side by side with the people who might have been responsible for the execution of your parents, siblings, grandparents. And it's one of those interesting things that's very hard to bring up because you're so worried that you're going to offend somebody or that you're going to hurt somebody's memory of their family. So unfortunately, there was a lot of social pressure as well as political pressure. Neither group wanted to talk about it to prevent a civil war, but even amongst neighboring people who all knew where the mass graves were, it was sort of an issue of taboo because they still had to live next to each other. They still had to associate with each other. And unfortunately, it creates one of those situations where nobody wants to speak <coughs> up about what happened. So why did they eventually speak up? Um, the main reason they eventually started to speak up was because um, that journalist I showed up, Emilio Silva, started to unearth the mass graves, started to pull in intellectuals from around the world to come help him, and he actually created the association that I mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me, because I want to say it in English and not in Spanish. Give me a sec. The um, Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory, which became both a national and an international institution that started to unearth the mass graves. So part of the reason that memory started to become more popular was because they started to experience a lot of outside pressure coming into Spain, but also from the younger generations who wanted to learn about their families, who wanted to be able to bury their grandfather. So you kind of had both factors going into place there. Um, my answer is probably shorter, but <laughs> the truth is buried out of convenience and to make another country look good, in my opinion, and uh, because they want to protect their own interests and their own image over what actually happens. That's all I gotta say. Oh, uh, mine will be longer, I guess. <laughs> um, so, uh, as as you, as you mentioned, Dr. Bauer, factcheckermedia.com. Uh, this this was a website that came out in 2015, which is the centennial of the Armenian genocide. And it, if you were on Google Turkey at the time, which 93, it's either 93 or 95 percent of internet users in Turkey use Google as their primary search engine. So, if you're on Google Turkey at the time and you punch in in Turkic Armenian genocide or other related terms, this is the very first site that pops up, uh, factcheckarmenia.com, which is a denialist site. And it's uh, if you ever poke around it, which maybe don't, because then it gives them unique user traffic. But <laughs> if you ever do poke around it, it's extremely well constructed. And it paints it as an extremely well told story. And it, it offers, to use a really popular phrase now, alternative facts for, for, what, for what happened. And, uh, and this, this definitely poses an issue because discriminating among, among truth and, and non-truth, you know, there's fact and fiction, is extremely difficult when what appears to be a really well-crafted website is the number one thing that you click on. And most people click on the number one thing. And if you don't click on the number one thing, you're probably clicking on Wikipedia, which is just as easy to manipulate as any website that you own yourself. So this definitely pro proves to be an issue. And the three, uh, the three scholars from UMass, from Princeton, and the University of Louisville, uh, they, I mean, if you read something and it says, uh, it says Gunther Louis, University of Massachusetts, it looks extremely credible. But Louis is, is widely despised by, by his colleagues. And a lot of his work is widely disregarded. So I mean, what, the way to discriminate among them is read a lot more. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and unfortunately, it does create an issue where it is very hard to tell what are facts and what are alternative mm -hmm. facts, to use the popular term. Especially because, unfortunately, I, I work in the Writing Center. I've worked there for four years. And a lot of people genuinely do not know how to tell whether or not something is credible. They don't know that you're supposed to look at the kind of evidence that's used. They don't realize that you have to do deeper research, which makes it much harder for people to get an understanding of what we would consider <coughs> the truth or um, truthful history. So unfortunately, you are going to have to read a lot more. And in my case, if it comes from the internet, it has to go through a very long scouring process. <laughs> yes. All right, let's give a round of applause for our panelists.